Hey, everyone. This is Amanda Bates, host of the Global Chatter podcast and the founder of The Black Expat. You may have heard me refer to Families and Global Transitions, or FIGT, in the past. That's the organization that was co-founded by Ruth Van Raken, the well-known speaker and co-author of Third Culture Kids, Growing Up Among Worlds. My journey with the organization started years ago when I met Ellen Mahoney, who was founder of Sea Change Mentoring, and she encouraged me to attend a conference. To make a very long story short, I attended, and wow, did it change my life. I met so many amazing people who are talking about cross-cultural living, especially my next guest. Donnie Aldine is a complete force. She is a global marketing and communications expert who, by the age of 19, had lived in and identified with seven cultures on five continents. And Donnie has leveraged her gift of compelling storytelling, empathy, and business acumen to build cultures, a global multicultural lifestyle network that celebrates the experiences of those who straddle cultures and identities. In a world where very few of us check just one box, what she's built is speaking both to our today and our future. We had a great time recording this episode, and I hope you enjoyed as much as I did. Welcome to the Global Chatter. Today's guest is Donnie, who I am thrilled to have y'all. I, I mean, and, and I say this seriously and one of the best things I have continuously said about this podcast is the amazing people that I get to bring on. And she's one of them. So I first met her, oh gosh, it's, it was years ago because we were both on the board of Families in Global Transition. She was on the board. I was on the board. And that's when I first heard her name and got really connected to her work. And since then, I have followed what she's done. I've had the privilege very many years ago, being in Cultures Magazine. And I've also had the privilege of being on her podcast, which if the episode hasn't aired yet, by the time you hear this, it, it will sometime this year, and you'll get to hear a little bit more of my story. And so having her here is just, it's a treat for you guys, because I think that she brings a perspective and is such a great storyteller that I'm excited for you guys to hear her. So Donnie, with that, welcome to the Global Chatter. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Oh yeah, my gosh. Y'all here for a treat because we had a little <laughs> bit too much fun on my podcast. And let me tell you, we just had a little bit too much fun pre-tape. So, you know, we've got to calm it down. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, honestly, I feel like if you're, if you, look, this is season four. They know how hype it can get. So if, if you, if you stuck with this podcast this far, you <laughs> already know it's probably going to go off the rails at some point, but oh, you yeah. love that. So that's why you're here. <laughs> So here's the so here's the thing. Here's the question I ask everybody because we're an international focus podcast. So where in the world are you right now? You know what's so funny about you asking me that? Literally three people just texted me that this morning. That's that's actually the standard question because last year I was in I need to count them up. I don't remember. I was in at least 20 countries last year wow. on a world tour for cultures, my organization. And I lived in at least six countries. So at this moment, I'm where our headquarters are, which is Fort Collins, Colorado in the USA. And it's not usually this kind of cold. I know people think of Colorado and I, I shouldn't say this because I'm letting the secret out. This is why so many people are moving here. So I should probably keep it quiet. I should <laughs> say it's raising here. Don't come. Right, don't come here. <laughs> right. But this year it's a little bit cold. So I'm supposed to be in Costa Rica the next couple of months which I'm also Costa Rican. So I'm looking forward to that. And normally I don't try to escape the cold, but this year I, I really, <laughs> I'm looking. And I also haven't really been in winter the last mm -hmm. couple of years. I was in South America most of the last couple of years. So at this moment I am in Fort Collins, Colorado. Oh my gosh. And I'm, I'm excited to dive into that because even you mentioning how many countries you were in last year and how much traveling you've been doing. And and keep in mind, this has also been in the midst of this pandemic. So you, you've still been doing it. Um, yeah. I really want to get to that. But with every guest that comes on, usually the second question is this. So where does your international story begin? Uh, well, actually, it begins pre-birth. But my first travels 
were at age two weeks. So I say begins pre-birth because my father is Costa Rican. Unfortunately, he, he passed away with COVID, which is one of the reasons I was traveling South America during COVID. And my mother is Trinidadian from Trinidad and Tobago. You know, from there, because, and people always ask why. You and I talked about this on my podcast a lot of times in the past. I think things are changing now. They would say, oh, were you a military brat? Which there was a period of time I was a military brat. Not very much. My brother actually identifies as a military brat because even though we were only two and a half years apart, his experience is very different than mine. I consider myself a global, global nomad TCK, whereas he's more of a military brat TCK. But uh, we can get into that. But it, uh, my parents met. So that's why I think uh, my story started before that, because I'm very, very proud of my Costa Rican and my Trinidadian heritage. Uh, I was born in the United States, New York City. And at age two weeks, I went to Trinidad and Tobago. My first accent was Trinidadian. And from there, just start traveling. I think at age four, I went to Spain. <clears throat> Excuse me. I, I just had someone on my podcast where we were talking about, I didn't know they were a professional ballerina. And one of my fondest photos from my childhood was in Spain. I was a ballerina and it was a ballet recital. It's just so cute. Cute. The cutest pictures ever, right? Most of my kid pictures, I'm like, well, but those, I mean, I just have really fond memories. I was there for a while and then came back to the United States to, um, to New Mexico, which was for uh, for my mom being in the Air Force. And then went back to Trinidad, went to Turkey, which is my favorite place in the world. This is the first time. So 30 years later, I went back to Turkey this summer. And you know, when you're a child, everything looks bigger and brighter and happier, right? Hopefully, hopefully. And and you have these memories and then you go back later and you're like, oh, well, it's so tiny, you know? Like, <laughs> And so I was a little nervous. I thought, here all these years, Turkey's been my number one place. What's it going to feel like now? Oh, can I tell you? I was not disappointed. It was everything I remembered. It was fantastic. And I lived on the Asian side when I was younger. I went to the, both the Asian and the European side when I went this summer. So it was nice. And so from there, you know, back to New York, then to London, then to school, then in Colorado, then or college in Colorado, then Germany and uh, all, all the things, many places. So I grew up on five continents and seven cultures. And even still today, I mean, I've been researching this and studying this for, is it 18 or 20 years now? You know, I taught a class about this at university for 11 years. And so I'm constantly working on it and unpacking. But now that this is really what I do for a living, I'm always uncovering something new, some new little tidbit that's, oh, that's interesting, and discussing it with other people who have similar but not exactly the same lives and just looking at the different perspectives and learning so much about yourself and about them. And, them. and that's really important because every day anymore, I really see how our perception, I mean, we all know our perceptions are based on how we grew up, about our life, about our world and what our surroundings look like, what we think things should be and look like. But every day I really see how much that affects us to the point that even when you see something or someone says something to you or you hear something, you don't necessarily hear what they're saying. You don't necessarily see what you're seeing. You twist it into something you can understand. And then that is your perception. Now, we all know that's real, but I mean, I see it to the nth degree now where sometimes you have to make people pause and go, no, 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 look at it again. <laughs> and, and to see the shock on their faces when you make them stop and think it through. When you ask them to really, did you really see that? Did you really hear me? For them to pause and think, what did that really mean versus what I made it mean in my head? Mm. That has been really interesting and eye opening. And for myself, too. I have to do it for myself. You know, mm -hmm. I've had people say, oh, me, you know, they ask me questions. Oh, well, you're the cultural expert. What do you think? And I'm like, no, 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 please don't give me that title. Do not give me that title. <laughs> because, yeah, I might have some expertise, but that doesn't mean you know everything. My expertise is to constantly make myself remember that it's always learning. You're mm -hmm. always learning more. There's always something new. There's an experience, a person, a background that you've never heard of that will blow your mind and expand your world in ways that you can never 
truly appreciate. And so I try to stay in that place. And that actually is my happy place. Let me ask you as a follow-up question, because you've said so much that's pretty rich and I, and you've, you've pulled out some threads that have stuck out to me. So clearly you were a third culture kid, right? You were also a cross-cultural kid having parents of different nationalities, right? Yes. And you said something that I always think is really interesting. And I always try to say this to parents who are raising third culture kids. Your brother had a different, like he, he labels himself a little bit different. I mean, you're both third culture kids, but he labels himself different. I'm curious, why is there a difference in how y- y- y'all see your experiences? If there is, so I gave him the label, <laughs> okay. but it was, you know, again, I mean, cultures has just enriched my life in so many ways. And because just like what what you do, right? You get the opportunity to dive deeply into the richness of everybody's life, right? And so when we first started it about eight years ago, we had a barbecue. And I was so excited, right? I live in Colorado, or kind of. <laughs> I mean, my home base is Colorado. And it's a very homogeneous type of place most for the most part. And uh, so I was excited because we had this uh, international potluck or cross-cultural potluck. We had people from Kenya and Mexico and third culture kids and cross All the people came and the point was for them to bring food from their culture. It was supposed to be two hours long. Started at noon. Do you know we were there till almost one? They had to kick us out. 1 a.m. Okay. Right. right. And because we were, we, none of us get to experience this. None of us get to be around people like this. And we told stories all day. And no matter what the culture, the stories, everybody could relate. And we were laughing and all the great things. So that was the day I found out that my brother thought of himself differently than I did. And that was the day that I realized. And, he, and there's other things throughout my life have, that have made me stop and realize, oh, wait. Your siblings' experiences aren't like yours, right? And and each of us is a little bit different. So in this case, I, gosh, I'm trying to remember. Okay, we broke off in terms of where our experiences were mirrored right when we left New Mexico and went back to Trinidad when I was 11. And we went to New York City. He lived with my grandmother. I lived with my great aunt. Now, it was only a couple blocks away, but completely different experiences, right? And then from there, I went to Turkey. We were back together. But I know for me, it changed who I was as a person because my safe space, which was, it was my mother, my brother, myself. It was the three of us. We were just, oh man, the tightest little family. So much love, just got everything understood, even though my mom was from Trinidad and we were basically from the U.S. at that point, because, you know, I didn't really remember my Trinidad experiences at that point. Later, people had to tell me how it was when I was little, right? We were just very tight and very loving, great family, good experiences, great childhood at that point. Then when we got split apart for, again, now that I've done the research, I realize what that is. But that was the umpteenth time of being split from people who were important to me. So I put up a shield around my heart, Mm -hmm. right? I, you know, I could tell you, my brother and I have never had this conversation. We probably should, but he spent decades. It probably isn't until recently that I let that shield down. He spent decades trying to get back that relationship that we had before. I mean, we still have it. But he knew, he was like, what, there's something, like, I can't get to that little peak. Like, where is that? Why am I peeking over this wall, right? And and I always knew what it was, but we just never spoke about it. This is probably the, one of the first times I'm saying it out loud. But yeah, that's that was the difference. So we broke apart at that point. And then from there, our experiences were very different. Where he went was different than where I went. And we came back together many different times. But when you add it up in total, he had a lot of military brat experiences. I had a lot of global nomad experiences where I went mm. to school in different places. I met different people and it was, it was just a very globally nomadic life. And whereas his was a very military brat life. So he might've had some nomadic experiences, but they were very military based. You know, what's really interesting, I think in that story too, is that... <laughs> Usually when I think about TCKs having being in the same home, but having different experiences, it's 
they're going to the same places, right? <laughs> so it's like children who are in the same house and it's a family unit. But I think what's even an extra interesting layer is y'all were going to different places yeah. that were still like, <laughs> that were still international had that movement to it. And that, and that, that together. So that's why yeah. it was hard to identify too, right? Yeah. Until I had to sit down and think it through because that happens. And then you forget about it. like, oh, I went to visit grandma in 1992. You don't sit and think, oh yeah. And then 1997, I saw her again. But when you sit and you look at all the experiences together, you start to see the many times you were separated and came back or whatever the case may be. Right. And in my case, it wasn't until my little brothers uh, who are about 14 years younger, one of them, he just kept pressing me. And I was like, why are you asking me all these questions? But then I stopped and thought about it. And I realized I actually didn't spend a lot of my childhood with my family. Mm. And I didn't realize it until then. And then when I said something to my mother, probably two decades after I realized it, she was in disbelief. No, that's not true. And I said, let's count up the years. But same thing, because you're not really thinking about it as it happens. If you weren't with immediate family, with you, were you with extended family or were you with other, other All individuals? Of above. Okay. Immediate, extended, and other. And All other. Of- <laughs> wow. <laughs> So did you at any point, I'm just curious, in your schooling, so K through 12, right, or preschool all the way to 12th grade or whatever, did you at any point attend international schools or boarding school? I'm going to take a little sidebar to come to your your uh, to the final answer. But along this journey, there's been times where I'm like, oh, these are my people, you know, my international friends, or these are my people, until something would happen. You're like, oh, no, they're not my people. <laughs> And one of those times was, you know, you hear my accent, you look at me, people usually think I'm African-American. And I know that those aren't facts. And even people who know those aren't facts, they forget because what they're looking at and what they're seeing or what they're hearing, excuse me, makes them think something else. So friends where they would start talk about boarding school and then be like, oh, you don't, you don't understand what that's like. And I'm like, really? Like, seriously? Okay. You're not my people, right? Because you're putting me in this U.S. box, which I should be in because I'm from the United States and, 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 right? So technically, no, I did not go to international school in Cape. Well, let me think. Hold on. Hold on. on. No, I did not go to international school in K through 12. Let's see. Some of my, <laughs> okay, check this out. Some of my international experiences, we didn't go to school at all. So when I went back to New York at 13, I think, I had to take a test. So when I was younger, both my brother and I, we were put back twice because we we're too far ahead. And I was in kinder. I should have been going to first grade at the time, but I was put back to preschool like three times. My brother was put back, I can't remember, to first grade or something like that. And then when I got to 13, because we didn't go to school for a while, and they were like, well, we don't know where you're supposed to go. You have to take a test to see where to place you. And I gained my two years back. Okay. So I got placed two years ahead of where I would have been had I gone into the grade that I should have been in had I stayed in school, right? I mean, when I say had I stayed in school, meaning had I stayed in school on the international trip. And here's what's funny. Here's how that affected me. It wasn't until my 40s that I realized all the things that I attributed to people learning in sixth and seventh grade were things that I didn't get my entire life, but I didn't acknowledge them because I'd be like, oh, they must have learned that in sixth grade. They must have learned that in seventh grade because those were the grades that I skipped ahead. And then now I do this work and I did the studying and I was like, holy crap, that was like a whole lifetime worth of stuff that I was attributing to two years of knowledge, right? This is why I don't know this or that or whatever the case may be. And had I had I not skipped those grades, maybe I would have realized sooner that it was just because I was different. My experience was different. Not everybody was like this. And full disclosure, I never finished fifth grade because at that point, my family decided to move to, to Cameroon. I just never did fifth. Like I started it. I just never, <laughs> I never finished it. Where one day you went to school and by the end of the day you were in a different country. That seems that's actually very close to when they all tell the story. I just I did like a quarter of fifth grade and then that was that right. for that year and we were just like you know what let's try sixth grade. 
<laughs> but obviously we're both successful, so it did not hold us back. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I think reading helped. But what I was going to ask you in your case, because it's totally, it's cool to see kids being world schooled and whatever right now. This is not what happened. What happened was I moved to a different country. It was a bit of a hassle. So I just read books and <laughs> waited until the next academic year rolled around. So for you, was there, was there even home, was it even homeschooling or was it really, it, School was on pause for you guys, or at least for you. Yeah, school was on pause. Okay. There's a whole lot. I mean, we it's only our <laughs> podcast, so I tell you all the stories. But <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's totally okay. No judgment. I'm just saying it. To, I it was totally on pause for me for a solid yeah. year. So okay, I didn't I didn't know if there was a only a few months, but enough for. So that's when I was in Turkey, and but enough for when we came back to New York that the schools were like, we're not sure where to put you. <laughs> right. <laughs> Right. So, you know, but it, it worked out. And I, I remember I was thrilled because I'm like, these are the two years you took from me. <laughs> right. <laughs> I, I took them back. <laughs> you know, where where I'm I'm interested is you've had these experiences, you're you know, especially as you get to your young adult years you eventually get to college and what did I, I always ask this question, especially when I think about what people do now, when you went to college, what did you think you were going to study and what, what did you study? Oh, wow. So, well, you know, you come from people like mine, you know, there's, there's certain countries where it's like four things that you get to be right. As an adult, <laughs> doctor, lawyer, engineer, accountant. Is that the fourth one? Maybe finance. Uh, you doctor, lawyer, lawyer getting is it finance there's got to be finance no engineer engineer engineering ah uh, i forgot yeah yeah yeah. Uh, yeah yeah finance engineer doctor lawyer yeah yeah finance yeah, yeah. <laughs> so and i remember being little because my mother is this fantastic cook it's so my mom or chef my mom and my little brothers are all about cooking that's their whole careers right my mom shoot she can throw down some shit out of your food and plus she you know she makes her own thing as a chef she comes up with things i guess it would be considered fusion, but whew, like, like nobody's business. Right. And so when I was young, I'm trying to remember if I ever wanted to be a cook, I guess maybe I never did want to do that because also college was instilled in your brain at a young age. Like there was no, do you want to go to college? It was, you just talked about it. So everybody, including you just expected to go to college. Like there was not another way of thinking. You didn't think about how to do it, which is interesting when I got to that point, because I had to figure it out myself. Nobody thought about that, but <laughs> think about how to do it. Just It was just an expectation that you would do it. And also the school system was very different than Trinidad. You know, I remember people used to, my classmates would laugh at me How in like ninth grade when I was trying to tell them that if I were still in Trinidad, I'd be in college. And they're like, what are you talking about? <laughs> Right, they like they can't even imagine that the school system could be put together differently than the way we have it here. So I wanted to be. My grandmother was a nurse. I just recently, again, through cultures, just uncovering all the things. My grandmother in the twenties left Trinidad and Tobago. So my great grandparents were the builders for the University of the West Indies. So there was a lot there. There was a lot there in a very prominent family. And so it was interesting to find out that my grandmother left to go to England, which at the time, Trinidad was a British Isle. And I remember when I first heard the word Commonwealth, I'm like, when did that happen? <laughs> like, what is that about? But, you know, that's that's a now thing. And let's see what happens with that. But she was one of the group that went to London to learn nursing. And there's a whole history behind that with um, the UK doing that. And so my mom, my grandmother came back to Trinidad and brought her kids. So my mom, technically, that was a, another thing I learned throughout the years. Both of my parents were TCKs. It's, and my mind was blown when I figured that out. It's like, there's sometimes, and then I realized how people must see me. I'm, sometimes I'd be like, my parents are weird. And then one day I was like, no, they're TCKs. Holy crap. So many things do, 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 fell into place that I understood about them that they probably don't even understand about themselves because I acknowledge that they had this experience, right? And I wish I had figured that out sooner. I would have been able to be an even better daughter, right? But um, but my grandmother went back, got her kids, came to the United States. 
uh, and was a nurse for many years, sponsored so many people to come to the United States, owned a number of brownstones in New York City. And I think through that and I think, you know, a single black woman in the in the 40s, a uh, single mom with two kids and sponsoring all these people and look what she did with her life, right? Now, I also have a theory about that. And we look at generations and, and entitlement and things like that. Like that didn't trickle, the, the traits trickled to me, but not necessarily the cash because then you have a generation of kids that are used to things being given to them, right? Or And or have some of the trauma from being a TCK that no one is dealing with and that kind of stuff. All oh, that's a whole nother story. But so I wanted to be a nurse for the longest time. Mm. And because my grandmother was a nurse. And then at one point, my mom was in the Air Force. So I wanted to be in the Air Force because my mom was in the Air Force, right? And then I settled on, I mean, I was really good at science and I loved science I'm from the eighth grade. Oh, I don't know if you know, in the 70s, there was a TV show called Quincy. Quincy Emmy, medical examiner. I didn't know that met coroner. So, <laughs> well, no, I think I knew he was a coroner, but that's what I studied from eighth grade. And when I got to college, that is what I intended on doing. And so I was in pre-med. But nobody could tell me what it took. Really what it was was CSI, right? So back in the day, it was a medical examiner, but everybody turned that into coroner. So they're like, oh, you have to go into politics. You have to be voted into that position. I'm like, I don't want to do that. So it's like I spent all this childhood expecting to be CSI, really, in my head, right? Didn't know what that was called. Didn't know how to do that or get there. And no one could tell me. So I was like, okay, well, I guess I'm going to be a doctor. Of course, all the family back in Trinidad is so ecstatic. You can have a doctor in the family, right? One of the four things you get to be, the four best things you could ever be. <laughs> and so I started doing, you know, apprenticeships and things like that. And I was just with my one of my friends from college because I have all these pre-med friends who are doctors now. And I just spent New Year's with her and I was taught, she was like, I'm so proud of you. Look at what you're doing. Oh my God. And I said, but look at you, you finished what we started. You started pre-med, you're a doctor, right? And she was like, oh yeah, that's true. But the reason I didn't do it is when I did all the apprenticeships, they were like, don't do this. <laughs> do not go into medicine. Do not follow these footsteps, right? And thank God they weren't lying. I mean, I understand now because it wasn't until my senior year of college that I switched and I switched to journalism, journalism and public relations. And then I went, of course, when I got into PR as a career, I, I went into marketing after that because I really needed that logistical part. PR has a lot of strategy to it as well, but marketing has even more, a lot of logistics to it, marketing strategy. And so that's where all of that came from. But um, I decided I switched on my senior year and then I ended up going into pharmaceuticals because it melded the two right? Pharmaceutical marketing had that marketing end and then it had that science end. I still got to do it. And I still miss science to this day. There are times that I was like, man, wow, I could have, that could have been great, but I love what I do. And I, and I learned so much about myself and about other people and the key, you know, you and I, I see us so differently. I mean, there's a lot of kids today, Gen, Gen Z, Gen Alpha, even, well, you're probably a millennial. <laughs> You're not, you're just, are you a Gen Xer? <gasps> oh, <laughs> <That's> a, <laughs> I know every time they go, you're a millennial. I'm like, no, I'm an Xer. All right. I mean, yeah. you know, black don't crack. All right. So if you're joining us from after the break, you first of all discovered I was a Gen Xer. So, that, so there's that. But also Donnie was giving her story of how she ended up studying what she did in college, which I think is great because and, and the reason I asked that question is that I know that you've had a career that has had intersections in communications and business and academia. And I'm sure there's some consulting and strategy in there and definitely PR work. And, and the reason I bring that up is because I really want to get to the space of where you are right now. And so particularly with cultures. And so 
for people who have not mm-hmm. been exposed yet or, or, or don't know, can you talk a little bit about cultures and, and really your reason for starting it? Well, thank you. You know what? You're so, I, I'm so impressed with how perceptive you are. I mean, literally everything. I remember when I was going through my career, I was like, oh, it feels like so many twists and turns, but it was all, I feel intended. I feel like this was my life purpose. My whole life got me to this point. And every part of my career has been media, marketing, and multiculturalism multiculturalism, every single part from the, from birth, from the TCK part, from the languages, from the science, all of it together. The science was, you know, critical thinking and decision-making and, and really deduction that I see missing a lot. Like when I was teaching at college, oh gosh, (laughs) right. That's Um, critical thinking. (laughs) And so Media marketing and multiculturalism, which is what cultures is about. So cultures, C-U-L-T-U-R-S, the missing E stands for the missing diversity of our population. And it's really for the in-between cultural spaces. So we, we amplify or activate 21st century cultural diversity for the culturally in-between. So that's multi-ethnic, multicultural, mixed race, and geographically mobile people like immigrants, refugees, and third culture kids, okay? Which I fit most of those categories, right? Um, and so we do that because we think everyone should feel like they matter. And I don't know about you, we talked about cult- cross-culturalism, but for me, sometimes it's worse being in cross-cultural spaces than in majority spaces because I'm dismissed even more than I am in a di- majority space because I'm Mm. not only told that I should conform to the masses, but I'm expected to just like we say that majority culture does to minoritized culture. My minoritized spaces does it to these in-between spaces. So people who are mixed race, people who are immigrants, people who are TCKs very often. And that's where a clash comes. I think a lot of time very often are, expected to and often told to know you should be like this or you are like this. I can't tell you how many people literally argue with me as to how I am. <laughs> Quote unquote, no, you're like this. <laughs> it's like really- No. And and I and that that does resonate with me when I think about coming back for college after being in Cameroon, right? So we're in a very highly racialized society, right? That has very in- intentional and specific boxes for a lot of reasons, right? And we are seeing changes. I think in our lifetime, we are seeing some changes, especially within different spaces, but we both present as black, obviously, mm-hmm. at least in this space. And now never mind that your black and my black are from <laughs> different places, right? Yeah. We, we, we uh, on the street, we black, right? Nobody, nobody's <laughs> thinking about the Trinidadian, Costa Rican in you. Nobody's thinking about the Cameroonian in me. Mm-hmm. We black. And then we have these accents. And you're right. I think it's interesting how even within communities we're like, we want you to conform and be this way. And there's not enough space for, there's so much nuance because I think both of us started our platforms. And, and, and of course I have the black expat, but both of us started our platforms to talk about nuance and allow for nuance, yep. I think. Right. And for me with the black expat, I've always said, first and foremost, all these black stories are different. The only thing they may have in common is that they're black and they're mobile. Mm -hmm. Right. So I can see where you're, where (laughs) to the point that you're making, why you've created the space you have, because quite honestly, these spaces we've created is because these spaces didn't exist for us. Exactly. And, you know, I think before I found out about third culture kid, which there was a period of time too, we talked earlier about me going, Oh, these are my people, which I think mostly third culture kids are my people. But as I was at university and teaching a, a class for that, really saw that a lot of majority TCKs didn't understand the TCK experience of people of color, right? Mm-hmm. That yep. they're, they're, and same way as TCKs of color from a homogeneous population really can't relate to my experience as a person of color from a geographically and culturally yeah. mobile situation, right? Yeah. Really often don't get, and it's almost worse often more closed minded to what your experience might be. And, you know, I have grace for that because I look, you know, one thing I had to learn and, and 
When COVID started, we had an issue, one of our best issues called Time for Change. And we had a spread in there that said blackness around the globe. So we had all these, this different, actually, that would be a great issue for you. I should send it to you. All, you should. all these, yeah, definitely. All these different perspectives of what blackness is from every, I mean, so many different angles, so many angles. And from that, that was important to me because when I would teach the class, people just expected you to be like them. And, and in that particular, um, issue, there was a woman. So a daughter, I'm trying to remember where they're from. I think they were from Nigeria. So she was American. Her parents were Nigerian. They were immigrants. She actually repatriated, I guess for her, she didn't repatriate. She expatriated to Mm -hmm. Nigeria. I'm pretty sure that's where she was from. But her mother made a, a, had a quote in the magazine in the intro to what is blackness that said every single Black first person from outside of the United States should learn African American history when they come to the United States. And that resonated with me so much because your perspective changes once you realize the history here. Because as people from outside of the United States, no matter where your trauma may come from, until you understand the trauma that the people here grow up with and are still living in and are steeped in every day, some of the choices and the actions and the ways of being don't necessarily resonate with people who have been in majority countries where everybody looks like them. Mm -hmm. Right. And there's the, and that even includes spaces, you know, like let's say Chicago or Atlanta or some other places where I remember the first place in the United States where I went and there were all Brown people. I was like, where is that? What? What? But it was still different for me. It was still not like being in Trinidad or in Africa or, you know, it was like, okay, mm-hmm. it's, wow, I'm shocked because I'm in the U.S. and everybody's brown and it's still the United States, okay? Right. And so um, me learning a lot about U.S. history, a lot more than I, is taught in school, really get, allowed me to have grace for the way of thinking. And so back to that conformity it made me understand, I think, my theory is, you know, so much is taken from you. You want to have some say over who you are. Okay, so who we are fits in this package. You know, mm-hmm. you, ha- you look like me, you need to fit in this package too for me to understand mm-hmm. you. That's how I've made sense of it. And it makes a lot of sense. I mean, I think it's a, here is a very resilient people that have put up with a lot and still living in it. And actually, the longer I stay in the US, I can see how it changes your mind. And that's one of the things that I have to, you know, work on to keep my mind open. Um, Mm -hmm. Because it, it does, it changes you. That's pretty powerful, because you're right, there's a resilience, especially when you are a minority And then to your point, things have been stripped and taken from you. And one of the things I think for me, and and look, I think you and I have both had, I'm going to call it weird, but I don't mean this in a bad way. We've both had the weird experience of being a minority in a majority white country and also being in a majority black country, right? And then coming back and being like, I tell people there's a certain whiplash right. <laughs> that, but, but, it, but what it does, and I, and I can at least say this for me is that it gives me a sensitivity in, in understanding what's going on in all, in, in all of these different black spaces, yeah. because right. I absolutely agree with you. I think it's very hard to be critical when you don't understand the nuances and it's so easy when you're coming from the outside especially when let's be honest i've always said this i was like my family came in the 70s so we benefited from the work that people did for civil rights Mm. we absolutely we absolutely did like we absolutely did that being said there are also histories and and you know i say this my mom lived in a country that did not become colonial like she she was alive and a teenager when her country got independent. So, so she's also lived in a colonial space and, and, and that's a whole other weird story. Right. For, for, with me in Trinidad. I, right, I, remember, right. I think I was in college in Germany when Trinidad got independence. I think that's when it was. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but, but do, yeah, but do you know? And so, and so 
I think then the need for the work that you do is important because it's just the way I look at my work. We also want to educate people when they enter these spaces to understand there are these nuances that you're dealing with and that you're contending with. And and too often, I think we enter spaces without having some semblance of information or even some sense semblance of like compassion <laughs> and then just feel like, well, why do they all do this or why is it that? And so I think you laid it out perfectly. And so I remember at the core and it's bigger than I remember at the core, you had a digital magazine, mm. right? Which, no, I know it's more than that because I've seen the print. And I've seen, <laughs> but I'm saying I, what, I, what I'm getting at is what is it today? Like cultures, what, it, what, what are the different components of it that are part of your platform? Which, by the way, so I just want to say I misspoke. After I said it, I was like, no, that's not correct. <laughs> it's in the 60s i think the early 60s and then um but i can't remember what it was something massive happened when i was in college if it was a coup or something like that anyway i mean it's always a look I, <laughs> <laughs> let me leave that conversation about coups but yes <laughs> comes with the territory when you're trying to get free and then also try to change government right right <laughs> So um, now cultures is all the things. So we offer media, a marketplace and resources. We call it media products and experiences. So the media mm -hmm. include, of course, that we've talked about the podcast, a print magazine, which uh, actually uh, you can see. It. I can see it. I can. I've been looking at it over your shoulder this whole time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We uh, I got to show you this. Uh, you <laughs> kind of see it back there, too, but. Our new membership box, I'm so excited about. Oh That's my gosh. Cool. So it, it, it gives you the best of the media products and experiences that I'll explain to you right now. But we, we call it our global immersion membership and we bring the globe to your door. We bring the world to your door. The intention is for all those in between and so in between cultures and the people who love them, because a lot of our audience is people trying to understand people like us, which is so yeah. refreshing to see, right? Like you really want to get it. You want to understand better. But um, every print issue of cultures, do I have one right here that I can show you? Every print issue of cultures has a destination. Mm -hmm. And so in the media, we have digital, we have print, we have podcast, we have um, web right? We have all these media. Oh, and of course, video. Um, and then uh, products. We have all these products. Before this, I was part of my business experiences. I was CEO of a gift manufacturing company. And we were, we sold to stores like Hallmark and Met Museum, that kind of thing. And wow. I, I can't remember, is it 45 countries? I'll have to go back and look. It was a while ago. So I took the six top selling products from that experience, including our world global, I'm trying to think of how to say this, our award-winning, globally award-winning um, party kit. And so we have a cultures, you can see it back there, cultures um, dinner party kit for a cultural dinner. So whatever destination we have in each issue, we also give you everything you need to throw a dinner party for 10 people, the recipes, videos that show you how to make them, the invites, the thank yous, the what, when, how, all the things, right? For 10. Wow. Yeah, it's pretty, wow. it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. I got it. I'm like, pretty cool. I'm like, try, can you slip me a box? Like, I'm trying to, you got me like, I'm like, I'll wait a minute. Slip you a box. <laughs> oh. And then y'all didn't hear that, but I, I will, I will then review and tell you how amazing it is so that the rest of y'all can go. Out. I will do it. I'll do it. <laughs> you will get this box. Is yes, girl. Yes. <laughs> I like this has now gone off the rails. Now it's about me and the cultures. Yes. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Go ahead. You will get globally immersive bath and body again for, oh, I wish you could smell it. I can't oh. smell it, but that looks amazing. Yes. For the destination. Wow. So every single destination we go to, we really envelop the smell and the sights and the sounds and the people. And we try to recreate the feel and the scent of that in our global bath and body collection for that particular space. So wow. you get oh, that is so creative. Uh, I'm just sorry. I just, it's like, I, I, and no, and I'm, I am actually really impressed. Not that I did not think 
that you could not do this, but it's more of a, it's not even something I have even conceived as an, I like it's hard. The fact that you've had this really intentional vision, which is why I think it's important to understand your early story and the, yes. and the mobility, because obviously your love for kind of going in across borders and seeing cultures and seeing communities and, and it being reflective in your products yes. that, I mean, that's so super important. And so, I mean, with that, I mean, obviously you were traveling quite a bit last year. So are you on the road quite a bit because of the work that you're doing? So we're always, you know, before last year was our fifth anniversary of print. So at the start of our fifth anniversary. So I did a five continent tour and that just kind of came together organically. It wasn't expected. I had different meetings in different countries. And then also as part of a tribute to my father, which ended last year, we had a year of Latin America last year. And so um, I had a new commitment to really get back into my Spanish, which this year you'll see the results of because we'll be doing a lot of our presentations in Spanish and in English. Most of my core team speak Spanish as well as English. So I'm excited to really bring that tribute full circle, right? But um, so it started, some of it was me and my Spanish in tandem with different meetings we had in Portugal and Spain, and then a friend of mm-hmm. mine uh, or a concert in Spain, a uh, meeting in France, a friend of mine, we had planned a 50th birthday for her in uh, Tanzania and Zanzibar. So by the time all of it came together, it was like, why bother go home? <laughs> we'll, just, we'll just stay gone, which was difficult. You know, people think I just love to travel. I actually love the cultural immersion, which is where I think this global immersion kit from came from, right? I like to be with the people and listen to the language and really get into the food. And, you know, now that I'm older and do this for a business, I do more of the sites, but I never did that probably until five years ago, right? And Mm -hmm. only in the last couple of years have I really gotten into touristy sites and that kind of thing. Before that, people, you know, even when I worked with doctors, when I was in uh, pharmaceuticals, uh, back then, a lot of people didn't travel. And so doctors were some of the few people that had been all these places. So we'd often bond over all these different countries I'd been to. And they would say, oh, did you go see XYZ? And I'm like, no. Well, did you see PSQ? I'm like, no. Well, did you see ABC? I'm like, no. And they're like, I thought you went to such and such country. And I'm like, I did. They're like, what did you do? I'm like, I rolled out in the street and talked to some people. Like, <laughs> you know, because... Most people literally travel. They go to see all the special things about that place. But to me, what's special about that place is the people. And so Mm. that's what I would go to see. But I've learned since then, it also is special to see the sights and and go to all the unique places. So I do both. And that is what we, what comes together in, in the membership. Yeah. And we try to create a community too. It's not just a box of products. It's also that we didn't get to the experiences, which as you mentioned, it's, uh, culturally immersive consulting. Uh, we send our experts. We have great experts at cultures. We send them around the globe to universities, et cetera, and corporations to speak. So you get discounts on that. And then also master classes and global travel. So yeah. all of that comes together from, as you just so astutely saw, basically my life experience. And that's why I say that this I feel like was my life purpose. This was what I was meant to do because it all kind of just fell in my lap. (laughs) And I say this in all seriousness. I think it's actually beautiful to see you kind of pulling the threads of the different part. It's like your life's quilt. Yes. And it's like all these different threads, right? I like that. And they're just interweaving. And because when you see people doing things in their element and it makes sense, like it really makes sense. And it seems so simple but, you know, and I, I I respect and I know as someone who's an entrepreneur, the work that it goes into it, right? Because I know that the other part is that it's very easy to say, oh, Donnie's traveling all the time. Like she's always on vacation. But to think very strategically, yes. right, yeah. about who your audience is, about what you're marketing, about what is important and relevant and what is true to your values, that's not easy. Yeah. And that's something you're doing day to day. And so I, I never, ever like, look, I, I always respect the game, man. Like I never want to be little the work that people do because I'm like, that's it's it's great when it's you. You love it. But there's still days where I don't know if you're like, I'm like this where I'm like, look, 
y'all just take this thing out of my hand. Let me, <laughs> let me just, I, I, I don't want to update the website. Earlier, there's so many days like that. And what keeps me going, um, it doesn't happen much anymore because we get so much of this. But in the past, like when I first started, I mean, it took a lot to get here. It took a lot, a lot of work, a lot of blood, sweat, tears, a lot of sacrifice. And the days that I was like, what am I doing? Why am I doing this? It would be the same day someone would text. I cried when I saw this, or this gives me hope, or I didn't think anyone cared, or, oh my God, you see me, right? Oh, that's all it took. It would be just like the, it was the same as teaching, teaching. It would just take one statement from <laughs> one student. Like, okay, I'll do it another semester. <laughs> As someone who came from academia, I understand. It's like that one student, you're like, okay, fine. I, I'll do it again. But the rest of y'all. <laughs> My little brother, actually, I mean, he's not little anymore. He's a grown adult like you. He's like you. He's on the cusp in the millennial, millennial thing. And um, he just told me the other day that he met a student of mine and was telling me all the great things they were saying. My mouth was on the floor. And he's like, why are you shocked by this? And I'm like, because I thought they hated me. <laughs> Like, he's like, well, your students love you. And this guy said this and that and that, and you changed his life. And I, my, I really, my jaw was on the floor. My jaw was on the floor. And I think that that, that I think really sums what I'm seeing with what you're doing right now. It's transformative. Yeah. And honestly, I am very excited to see what is coming next and what will be in the future. And so for the people who are listening and they want to get connected to the products, to what you're doing, where should they go to first? They should go to culturesmag.com forward slash memberships. Okay. And I believe I gave you a discount code as well. So uh, C-U-L-T-U-R-S-M-A-G.com forward slash memberships. And if they want to just read stories on the site, because we have lots of free offerings as well, they could just go to culturesmag.com. Perfect. And we will also have that in the show notes. It'll be also on the Black Expat website. I always say, if you can't ever find a guest, follow us because we're following them. So, 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 so we're definitely following cultures. Okay, Dottie. Like, I think we actually managed to be civilized and keep it, like, keep it on track for the most part. We did it. We did it. I mean, I'm not saying we did it well the whole time, but we like, we 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 got there. I mean, it may have taken a while, but we got there. Oh my gosh. I <laughs> I am so thrilled once again for the work that you're doing. I am so glad you came on. Yeah, I'm I'm actually really happy that you came on. I'm glad we were able Thank to Thank you. This and I'm not joking. I'm gonna send you a box. You are good. it's gonna make you come alive. And which by the way, I didn't say that. This is our whole purpose. We want to help people create a life in full color. So when you get your box, I think you'll have to tell me. Man, up, my cheeks a little rosier, girl. I will Instagram that. <laughs> Let me. You want me do the reveal? I what? never do. I, I never do. That. <laughs> now that I'm saying it, I have to do it. I'll. I will, I will, I will actually break my, like, <laughs> let me be on the Instagram yeah. for the black expat. And, uh, I really will. And I, I do it. I do it for stuff that I believe in and the work that people believe in. So I don't do it for everybody. No, and I'm actually really serious about this. People ask me all the time, but I will do this for you because yeah. I think that's just the coolest con. Like, honestly, it's cool. It's, I, it. it's, cool. It's, cool. it's cool. It's cool. You've just listened to an episode of The Global Chatter, which is hosted by me. Amanda Bates. It is edited by Stephanie Ficcio. Don't forget to subscribe to the Global Chatter on your favorite podcast platform. You can also follow us on Instagram at the Global Chatter or stop by Twitter and find us at Global Chat Pod. If you have a question, want to subscribe to the newsletter or are interested in sponsoring, visit theglobalchatter.com.